I was living in the moment, yeah. just trying to recover and then trying to, um, you know, just sort of become uh, focused on my my path in my future and mm. not, um, you not know, constantly looking back. And people would ask, well, why does your face look like that? Or why are you limping? Why do you, why are you always in a cast? Or why this, why that? And I'd just go, I was in a, an accident. I wouldn't get and into the... Then you have the, to tell this whole story again and again. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, and then, um, uh, and then it was interesting because I was supposed to do the TED talk on uh, an education thing. So I had this uh, tool in my other company, Synaptic Mash, for mm -hmm. personalization. And um, then they did looked at my bio, and they went, um, "You know, we'd we'd rather hear you talk about your personal life right now, and then we'll do." We'll, we'll still do the education thing, but um, so like right beforehand, I'm like, oh my God, I they spent a month, yeah, I spent a month getting ready for the TED Talk on the Ed, and then I had 15 minutes to write, you know, something up and then just tell my story, and so I was, I just blurted it just out there. It. it was great, though. It really was great. Um, oh, sometimes you. that's the best, because it just comes from your heart and what you remember and what you feel at the time, so, yeah. yeah. What I got... You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm very excited. We have Ramona Pearson. She's co-founder of Declara. Declara is a learning technology that bridges artificial intelligence, neuroscience, and algorithms that are under lock and key. And it's all to deliver personalized information for learning, which Ramona will talk about. Previously, Ramona was founder of Synaptic Mash, which was acquired by Promethean for an estimated $10 million. Her vision now is to bring neural and clinical sciences into modern day learning. And her inspiration actually comes from having to relearn absolutely everything from walking to talking to eating and even breathing, which we'll, which we'll talk about and hear about. And she is truly the perfect example of the phrase, triumph of the human spirit. Ramona, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with you. And Ramona, we've been referencing, you know, your titanium parts, your broken bones, your surgeries. Um, I know, Talking about that stuff or the story is painful a little bit, but um, could you tell people a little bit about what what happened? Yeah, so when I got hit by a drunk driver, my left foot got caught up in the wheel well, and um, so a lot of my damage happened to be on my left side. So I um, also suffered from blood chest trauma, mm. and. Um, my mouth had been damaged, which is why I've had to have like a lot of porcelain teeth and uh, implants done and uh, jaw repair and, um, you know, my tendons and my feet are, have been in ligaments in my feet and the bones were destroyed. Um, and then, you know, as they replaced all these pieces, and it's ironic because one day somebody was just going to go, I'll be in some museum, like the body museum, and they'll go, remember when we used to do this for people, and now we just inject them with stem cells and nanotechnology. So, and it grows uh, back, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, you know, and the, the thing is with um, a lot of the surgeries I've had, um, you know, the impact had been that those parts last for a certain amount of time, and then they have to be replaced again. Right. Unlike your human body parts, if you don't have an accident, they'll live for most of your life fairly well intact. And, and so um, probably the best experience I've had is with titanium and not with the bone transplants I've had. So I've had bone transplants and they've had to remove them. 
um, they either become necrotic or mm. my body has problems with them or they just don't take and, you know, just disaster after disaster with trying to get harvest bones. And, and it seems weird harvesting bones, but, you know, and it's strange to think that when you're waiting for a new knee or a tibia or an eye, you know, I have a cornea that you're waiting for someone else to have an accident. Right, so it's you horrible. Harvest. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. So the when we move to these new types of technologies, I jump right on them because then you're not you're not hoping some some horrible thing happens to someone else, which is a very weird thing. And you referenced before a big pen. What what happened with the big pen? Um, well, you know, I couldn't. My mouth was filled with gore, and um, you know the they couldn't get my airway open. And so he just took apart a big pin, some guy on the street. And wow. so I have this scar at the base of my neck and he stuck the big pin in there. And now, you know, now I have some lung and lung issues from all of uh, this stuff happening to me, but um, which is why my voice is a little raspy, but um, he saved my life and, um, it was just a random touched. bystander who did that. Yeah. You know, and what we've done is we've partnered with the Red Cross. So we've given them um, a broadcast on our platform. They have all their content on our platform so that they can, if somebody has an emergency or there's a disaster somewhere in the world, instead of going to their box and sending a PDF manual, they can now just send the insights and help save lives faster. We did all that for wow. them free because I owe them my life. It is amazing. I, I mean, when I read that or when I listen to your story, I can't believe all these bystanders came together and pretty much it sounded like they massaged your heart and they like opened up your airway and kept you alive. Yeah. And it's not even just that. It's my entire like my entire life. So of course I've got to build a platform that helps people uh, transform their lives. Um, you know, I owe the world so much, like these senior citizens who help yeah. me recover. I, I landed at a senior citizen's home after the hospital because they didn't think I'd survive. So they figured my life was sunsetting. So I'd end up um, with senior citizens and who were sunsetting their lives, but little did they know that their sunsetting was giving me a sunrise, mm. and they taught me everything, and they did it with joy. So it was. What like was life a- like when you left the hospital and went into the senior citizen home for you? Um, at first, it was confusing because I pretty much was not even really thinking I would survive. And um, I thought, okay, they're dumping me here and this is the end of me. And then, sure enough, the senior citizens were like grandparents. They were like, get going, wouldn't let me just get up. So they were the ones that were constantly driving to learn to speak, learn to... to, uh, uh, walk, learning to do everything all over again and didn't give me a second to rest or give up on anything. And I think it was through that process where they helped me start looking forward to living and building goals in my life instead of just giving up on my life. And that that gave me the gunshot I needed to blast off and become the person I've become today. So without them, I wouldn't be here. Yeah, yeah. So when you landed at the old people's home, the senior citizens' home, um, what were you able to walk, or t- I mean, what what were you able to do or not do at the time? Um, I had a cast all the way from the tip of my toe up to my hip because mm. I couldn't use that leg, and they didn't know what to do with it. And then um, you know, imagine trying to like they gave me a cane that I didn't know how to use and then I had two crutches to try to walk around so I'm like how do I navigate with a cane and I was about 68 pounds so I could barely 
hold anything. And then they had just opened up the tendons in my hand, so I could barely use that hand. So I was a disaster. So it would have been easier for me to just curl up in a corner and, and just die. Um, but what ended up happening were the senior citizens just kept um, uh, making sure that they found, they researched and found doctors for me. And, um, you know, I was always on the senior citizen bus going to all the doctor's appointments with the seniors and they mm -hmm. deliver me to these different doctors. And sure enough, you know, just the crowdsourcing <laughs> just worked for me. Mm -hmm. And, some doctor diagnosed me with uh, diabetes insipidus, which changed my health. All of a sudden, I could gain weight once they started medicating me mm. well. And, um, and then I was sent to Wyoming to have me replaced and a bunch of surgeries. In. And then I started being able to walk. And uh, then um, my biggest problem was learn how to be a blind person. Yeah. And from people who didn't know what it was like to be blind. So it was a trial and error experience and a lot of mistakes. So, um, but we persevered as a team and yeah. they mentored me through, through all of that. They finally sent me to the Braille Institute. So the grant, these senior citizens were like parents to me. Yeah. And, and I thought of them as parents actually. What is like, one of your fondest memories? from being in the senior citizen home? You know, there are a few. You know, there was a woman who was trying to teach me how to write, and she had been a teacher. She had Alzheimer's. So they'd always sit me next to her, and, you know, it, redundancy in writing is perfect. <laughs> oh, God. So never remember that she taught me something from before. It was a little frustrating. But then... I'd sit next to her and she'd always ask me at lunch, you know, what she was eating. So I'd have to feel her food and I'd always go, it's a hamburger. And she'd go, do I like burgers? Every day. So <laughs> it was like Groundhog's Day with her. But, but she was so helpful because she implicitly knew uh, how to write and how to be an educator. And mm. so she was super helpful. It just was frustrating that then the next day it was starting over again. But um, that was one of my fond memories because I, I learned a lot from her. And then um, uh, the men were really funny. They'd always ask me to go bear hunting with them. And of course, I hope they were joking, so it wasn't the bait. But, uh, right. you know, they, they just um, uh, brought humor and taught me gamification in learning that you really need to have a sense of humor and, and joy when you're learning, especially when you're trying to um, have to relearn other things. Because as an adult, even though I was broken up, I had an ego, you know, like I was like, I'm an adult, I should be able to speak and I don't want to goo goo gaga in front of people. But now I know why kids goo goo gaga, it's practicing. You know, so you have to practice with sounds, and so the guys just made it fun and uh, turned it into something joyful. So, um, you know, I owe them so much. I can't even tell you. Yeah, is that normal? They drop someone off at a senior. Season? I've never heard of that before. Yep, but usually, I mean, do they do that? Is that common? Like, if someone's severely injured, they'll they'll do that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Se severely long-term patients end up in nursing homes mm. and then they fade away usually. Wow. So what do you think it was, Ramona, that kept you, that like most people may have curled up in a ball and just given up? I think it was the joy that these people brought to my life. And, they're, you know, I was a stranger and they gave me so much love. And um, uh, they inspired me to persevere. And um, they invested their time and energy in me, and, and uh, that means a lot. And my last company, it's interesting because I had created, I partnered with McGraw-Hill and created something called The Power of uh, View. Mm -hmm. And what we had done is taken our algorithms and turned the uh, classroom upside down. So instead of 
kids adapting to the education system. We had the education system adapt to the kids. Mm. And we changed the schedules. We looked at the preferences in which teachers like to teach, either a large classroom environment, project-based learning, small classroom, mentoring, and uh, connected them with the kids that learned best in those conditions and conditions. And when we did that, we took kids that had been behind in math by three years and got them caught up to their age peers wow. in six weeks. The silver bullet wasn't the algorithm. The silver bullet was actually unhooking kids from feeling like they were not able to learn and helping them see themselves as somebody, something different. Mm -hmm. And um, that was inspired by these senior citizens. When they saw me not as a disabled person, but as a person who had potential and was going to blossom, it helped me see myself as a productive human being. And it, it drove me to feel like I needed to get on my path and get going. Yeah. And you know what? In even a 10-hour talk, we wouldn't do your story justice with what happened. So I, I really encourage people to watch the TED Talk about... I mean, you were in a coma for, I think, 18 months. Um, you were blind. You were blind essentially for 10 years because of what happened and, and numerous other things. So this, what we talked about just kind of touches a tip, tip, tip of the, of the iceberg. Um, so people should watch that. Um, so after all this, you then competed in the Paralympics. Yeah, I, I competed in... Um not even in the Paralympics, I competed in the Masters International Racing with sighted people. So, oh, wow. And, yeah, it, it's crazy, right? So, so you go from it, not walking, 60 yeah. pounds, not being able to see, not being able to speak, to, to what? Well, I'm kind of the modern day Forrest Gump. But uh, <laughs> the, the, what happened was um, I was in Durango. And bikes, you know, these professional cyclists were there. Um, and, uh, you know, they, uh, some of the college students at uh, Fort Lewis College were like, hey, let's take the blind girl for a bike ride. So, Sounds like an, a, a good idea. Not really a good idea. But we... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the local bike shop had a tandem and they sized me on it. Mm. And these guys, um, you know, uh, put me on a bike and started racing around and riding in the front. So the first thing, the first day was horrific because I hadn't bent that leg in years. And so um, the best way to rehab is to not, not know that someone's about to pedal and they just snap you right oh, into uh, movement. So that was my first experience with uh, true agonizing pain, but I'm surprised I, you got back on the bike. What what happened next? You know what inspired me to get back on the bike was it was years I hadn't felt the wind in my face. Mm. So all of a sudden I was like, "There's this pleasure pain thing going on." S and M. Anyway, there <laughs> this this pleasure that was coming from the pain in a weird way, but. It was the reward for tolerating that, and I would I, I can't believe how much pain I endured. And even when I was racing, I had incredible pain because they hadn't fixed that knee the right way for a long time. Um, but the uh, the reward was this feeling of freedom um, because when you're blind, you're either holding someone's arm or yeah. you're you have a guide dog or you always have a cane. Right. And to be on the back of the tandem was truly this, I could imagine, pretend like I was by myself, except for the person in front so I was yelling at you. So um, I had the good pleasure when I went to Europe to race to have, uh, you know, a great group of uh, master racers. Um, like uh, Glenn Winkle won six uh, World Cups and he... Wow. He um, captained the front of the bike for my world championships in the World Cup in Austria. And so uh, we won that. And then uh, Vera Bean was my coach and mentor 
to help me do that. And she had won all the, these U.S. national races. And so I, I, when I started out, all these guys would just take out riding. And then the guy that was the head of the bike shop, I don't remember his name, but he called up a friend of his who ran the um, uh, USCF, the United States Federation for Cycling, and said, hey, there's this crazy blind girl. Do you have anybody who take her into any of these races? And so they found uh, different professional riders who would ride in the front and captain. And uh, I raced and we got a silver at the Nationals. Wow. And so then I was invited to do be part of the international team. And that was great. It was truly uh a different experience for me and inspirational as well. That's amazing, Ramona. You know, we take so much for granted, you know, and what was it like when you first started to get your sight back? You know, it was, it was actually harder for me and Why? people are usually astounded. So I, yeah. I actually had declined having um, the surgery for a few years. Hmm. Um, and I did that because I could not imagine my life without my guide dog, Annie. Mm. So Annie was like my, it would be giving up a guide dog is like cutting off your arm because you have this dog that looks out for everything for you, finds cracks and stops for that, looks for tree branches, stops for those. And so uh, when I said, you know, I'm comfortable being blind and I can't give up my dog, people thought I was nuts. But I had truly become comfortable. And so I had a community and friends. I was racing bikes. I had a lot of joy in my life, except for all these surgeries that I kept having to have all the time. But yeah. um, anyway, Annie got sick. So I mm. opted in for the surgery, but it's not like in the movies where you wake up and right. you have this vision. <laughs> Actually, what happens is you wake up, and since I was blind for so long, I had lost a lot of the trace memories of what things look like. So I, I think they call it associative blindness. Like I would see. You see like a blob I, of something? Or what do you well, see? see you but I'd go what is that like you know like it, commonsensically you'd say human being or chair or whatever but everything felt mm -hmm. weird and I didn't have a name for it so I'd have to touch it and then as soon as I touch it I'd start putting a name to it so you can imagine as I'm touching people and things people probably thought I would look nuts but um but it was the only way for me to really relearn things. And and I still struggle with colors uh, because it's like I still have a little bit of a, uh, like a, a light curtain that's across the eye. So it's hard to, when things don't stand out, like yellow. The funny story is my partner back before Google Maps, um, she wanted me to go someplace, so she highlighted on a map where I should go with a yellow highlighter, and we had this fight over it. She, I go, you didn't give me the directions. I got gotcha. you. And, and I'm like, and she's yelling at me. It's all, it's right there in front of you, you know. And so it's just, you know, these moments, these little aha moments that right. oh, I'm not seeing the world the way other people see the world. Yeah, funny. And I couldn't tell, you know, there's one of a, a fun story that you have of when you first learned to walk. And I couldn't tell when you talk about it, if you're kidding or not kidding, when the old, the elderly people were teaching you to walk with the cane across the street. Is oh, yeah. No, I'm not kidding. Yeah. So, um, you know, I had a little bit of PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I would have that. Anyone would have that if, if that, you know, happened to them. Yeah. Yeah. And now... You have a cane, you know, a white cane, and, you know, you hope that drivers, when they see that cane, they go, oh, blind person, that blind person might walk erratically, so don't run them over. But, you know, people, being people, don't pay attention to the environment, and in fact, they may drive towards you if you're looking weird enough because they're attracted to just, it's a science that they actually have around that, why 
drivers run over people. Anyway, um, I was uh, trying to cross the street and or learned to cross the street, and this uh, woman basically said, you know, just stick your cane out there, and if a car hits the cane, don't cross the street. So <laughs> That's the worst idea I've ever heard. <laughs> worst idea. Like it bruised my hand and the cane's flying all over. And so finally, Kremling had actually put a, a crossing zone, you know, a ball crossing zone up there. So, but imagine closing your eyes when you come to a corner mm. and then trying to hear the traffic and trying to hear that the traffic's going in different directions and then trying to pick the time to cross the street and how do you know where straight is? So everybody's like, just go straight. And you're like, yeah, right. If you see. have a reference point. Right. So, yeah, so there's no reference point when you're trying to cross. So that's, anyway. I, I couldn't tell if you were just being funny or that you're being serious that you just stuck the cane out and like cars were hitting the cane. <laughs> I did. <laughs> it's crazy. That's why very quickly I ended up with a seeing eye dog. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, it's also stressful. So, like, the first time I tried to cross the street with a seeing eye dog, I was trying to control the dog so it wouldn't get hit mm. by, you know, I, and then finally they were like, if you can't trust the dog, you can't have the dog. Mm. So I had to just let go and let the dog take the lead. And then, you know, the amazing thing about a guide dog is if you step off or if you both make a mistake, that dog's going to push you out of the way and take the car. Wow. So um, I don't know how they can train a dog to do that. But uh, basically they are just like, don't fight the dog because you'll both live if it can push you out of the way and get out of the way That's at the amazing. same time. So amazing uh, amazing experience Ramona, how'd you get then from there to synaptic mash that is a lot i mean we need another hour or two <laughs> or just fast forward to synaptic mash yeah so essentially i um i finished up with college i ended up uh going to you know i did all of these races finished up with college and then decided i'd go to new york um after I had surgery and because I thought I need to start my life all over again and I figured what's the most complex city you can go to <laughs> let me make this <laughs> the hardest as possible for myself yeah <laughs> yeah all my friends said I'd starve to death <laughs> because I didn't know how to ask for food the way a New Yorker would but anyway I Ended up there, and um, I went to the New School for Social and Political Research, and that was after I actually was working at um, Camarillo State Hospital, mental hospital, with acute schizophrenics because wow. I was wow. interested, and that's a whole story. Especially, oh, I'm sure you have some crazy stories from that. Oh, incredible stories from that. Um, really funny ones, too. What's your but, favorite one from the acute schizophrenic days? Uh, there are. It's a good well, chapter in your book, by the way. Whatever, whenever your uh, your main book comes out, there has to be like acute schizophrenic days as a chapter. So go on. Yeah. yeah so I went there to uh, basically do um, my residency. So I went there, and um, my best friend was there as well as not as a patient, but um, as a candidate to be a doctor. Yeah. Anyway, she. Um, she and I showed up there, and we were. Uh, I was on the acute schizophrenic unit, and we would get these keys. Like they were a key to let people in, and then they'd give you these um, emergency things. So if you pull on the string, all the lights and alarms in the place go off if if you're attacked. Like dangerous situation, yeah. Yeah, because some of the schizophrenics had eaten people and done other things. They've eaten people. <laughs> they had a. They were locked up for violent crimes. Wow, so, crazy. So anyway, um, some of them, some of them with the eating disorders, or there were a malay of you know just an an array of different things right. going on. Right. So um, so you had those and. 
my I had a guide dog at the time, Annie. She, she went there with me, and I was blind. So at first, everybody was afraid, blind girls running around with these folks. And then what's the dog going to do? So um, one time I was talking to a, a patient, and she was holding a canister of milk, and then she fell on the ground. I have no idea why. So then I decided to just lay on the ground, and because she continued to talk as if she was standing up. Oh my god! So I laid on the ground. She and then she went, "Are you okay? You just fell." And I was like, "No, I. You fell." But then she was like, "No, I. I haven't fallen." But it was like she couldn't. She didn't realize That's that. So and then, and then she was like, "You know, we." we've all talked about you here and we feel so sorry for you being blind. And I was like, that is so ironic given the fact that I can leave at any time, but yet in the empathy that Mm. the folks there had had for me, even though some of them were in there for violent crimes and they weren't able to empathize with their victims, they had empathy. Right, because they said that they couldn't imagine anything worse than not being able to see. Wow. So it's all around context or Jeez. person's perspective, right? So yeah. that was an yeah. interesting story. And then the other funny story was um, my friend, I won't give you her name, but anyway, she was opening up one of the doors and one of the patients just pushed her over and went running out and took off and went running down the street. They and escaped, essentially. Escaped. And she was freaked out. She came to me and she goes, oh, great. You know, my first week here, <laughs> I've lost a patient. And I'm like, I can't help you find it. <laughs> and then she's like, can Annie, you know, be the sniffer dog? Oh, and God. one of the dogs came up and said, don't worry about it. When lunch comes, he'll come running back because they don't know <laughs> what to do with lunch. So... Apparently they ran all the time and came back. But there were a million stories wow. that, that were funny. And one time I did take a fall and the key left my hand. And then several of the patients started chanting, the one key, one key, because it's the key to get out. <laughs> and I'm like, great. So I pull on the cord to go get help. And, of course, there's no batteries in the stupid thing. Oh, so. gosh. But Annie protected the key, and uh, I was able. To I can only picture what this chanting and that happening. That <laughs> <laughs> it was a little like one who flew over the cuckoo's nest. But so, so synaptic mash. You're at so you start synaptic mash. Yes. What's your I, vision for that at the time? So I ended up. Um, uh, I fell in love with education, and it was an accident. Actually, I was working at the VA. And um, I decided to go visit a school in South San Francisco to see what people were doing for assessing because I was trying to build neuro assessments to quickly assess kid, uh, kids who were wounded. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, I realized, oh, my God, the school looks like when I went to school. Are you kidding me? So then I went, we've got to figure out how to get resources into the hands of teachers that aren't antiquated. Mm. So, so then I got, went on this quest. I actually got my master's in education so I could speak the language of a teacher and Mm. not as a neuroscientist and, um, took a fellowship and moved up to Seattle, started working in the school district. I built a, a big data social data learning network, you know, about the same time that Facebook came out and the kids named it the source. So it became the source of all their data Mm. and in social networking in the school district. And then, um, I, I decided to leave and started a company called Synaptic Mash. And I wanted to bring the cognitive and neurosciences into education so that we could help modernize things. But At that time, I had built uh, everything in the cloud, and at that time, you know, school districts were all about put the server behind, you know, in our server wall, so, and nobody was talking about the cloud, so I was a little bit out on, out in front by about three years, which is a hard place to be as a startup, because it's hard to get funding when people are like, what's a cloud? Right. (laughs) They don't have a name for it, even. Yeah. No. So... 
Uh, anyway, what was the biggest challenges with uh, Synaptic Mesh? Um, getting people to trust the cloud. Hmm. That even though you're putting data in the cloud, nobody can access it. It's locked down. It's secure. Hmm. Probably more secure than um, than when you have it in a server because this way you can um, you can protect the data in ways that somebody can't be you know in the school district so if a server goes down in the school district it could stay down for weeks or months but when you have um, you know an SLA as a business you're going to make sure those servers stay up or you don't get paid so there's an incentive to protect the data and keep that data highly accessible when you're when you're a cloud technology so I created, um, I was early to creating SaaS technologies for education. So what was Synaptic Mesh like at the height, at its height? Like what it looked like as far as uh, what staff that you had to hire and infrastructure and what the product was? Yeah, I mean, it was a pretty amazing tool. Imagine being able to, to like if, if a school district brought it in, and like the IT services at Seattle School had uh, 120 technologists. Now imagine if you brought in Synaptic Mesh, you could probably reduce all of that down to 20 people. The savings, because we took care of all the operational back-end systems, all of the data warehousing, mm -hmm. all the automation within grading and... Um, assessing and getting data to the parents, the school, the kids, and um, all in, you know, like a one-stop shop and very inexpensively. So we could roll up all the data from every every kid all the way from every classroom up to the district, up to the state, and up nationally if you wanted to. So. The product was used across the state of Indiana. We were in eight districts there, and then it continued to grow. Um, we were in several districts in Colorado and Seattle. Um, and then when Promethean bought us, we rolled out globally, so all over Mexico and um, uh, Europe, England. Um, now it's the data back end for all of the whiteboard technologies and those clicker technologies. What was so. it like selling your uh, baby? I mean, because I think it was nine years old or ten years old, right, when you... No, it was only three years oh, old. Oh, it was three years old. Okay. Yeah. We, we had built things very quickly. And, um, you know, when we sold it, um, you know, I became the chief science officer for uh, Promethean was interesting because I was coming up with ways of what if we could look at the process of learning by taking all the whiteboard technologies and the iPads and bringing, um, uh, and it was before the iPads, they kind of had their own version of the iPad. Mm -hmm. But um, if you could, could look at as a teacher is writing on the whiteboard and actually see where uh, a functional error was made and be able to correct that on the fly because what I noticed when I was looking at how kids would copy what they see the teachers doing the teacher made a mistake some of the kids who didn't have the foundational learning would copy that error and it would be built into their processes forever and other kids who understood fu fundamentally what they were doing would just ignore the teacher so they sort of had the gestalt and just self-corrected. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was interesting because I thought if we could understand the process of learning, we could actually stop some of the fundamental errors from being transferred to the students and yeah. auto-correct that and on the fly give professional development to teachers. So I came up with this concept called the Mobius Strip where all we look at all the student data and associate teacher professional development to all that student data so you'd help the educator always stay ahead of their students learning needs so I could see this you know you just have this life mission for learning you know all along the way so I don't know you may say you didn't but um, celebrate 
But what did you, after the sale, after you create this company from nothing, what do you do after the sale to celebrate or enjoy a moment just to step, you know, step back for a second? It's weird, but I didn't. <laughs> I knew, see, I, I somehow knew you were going to say that. Yeah. You <laughs> nothing. Know, I, Nothing. I went right into work and tried to help uh, Promethean become successful. And then, um, and then I had this aha moment, and I thought, I want to create a uh, an algorithm that becomes your concierge service on your iPhone. And and then I realized, well, that's helpful. But what if you can take that and build a platform that's much, much more um, bigger? and be able to bring ubiquitous learning to the mm -hmm. world. So so then Declare was born mentally and then as soon as my um, uh, last contracted day what came up at Promethean at midnight I quit. <laughs> you know one and of the biggest there. things to give people the extent in the backing behind Declara, uh, not just from a technology perspective, but a financial perspective. I mean, you have, like you were mentioning before, some amazing um, people have put money into the company, Peter Thiel's foundation. Um, what was the process of raising funds like? And I don't know if you can, I think it's public about talking about how much was actually raised. Um, this is a huge project. Yeah, it's a huge product in... Um we had for our A round. We had an unprecedented uh, round. We about thirty two point five million dollars. Huge, and yeah. Huge, and because what we're doing isn't a small thing; it's a huge thing. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, it it was hard, especially uh, in the early days, and you know, to get people to see what we were trying to do, and when we had early successes in these big countries like startups tend to go okay let me do something in a classroom or let me do something with an experiment and I'm like oh let's just load 40,000 people on and then you know 1.6 million people on but from Synaptic Mesh I learned how to scale up a, a platform and um, uh, you know we have incredible people working here so my chief operating officer had been the CTO for the National Basketball Association, the CIO for E-Trade, and then C uh, CVP or Corporate Vice President for Microsoft and built all the data centers in the world. And they have some serious chops. Oh yeah, so I'm like, oh, we got this. So, <laughs> so then, um, so then we realized, okay, let's take everything. Once we had these successes. I talked to the former formal um, investment uh, companies, um, you know, Peter Thiel, Data Collective, SUSE, and GSV, and they put in money, and um, then we went to town and um, put our heads down and, you know, went as fast as possible to build out the consumer side of things. So the power will be imagine being able to take your your knowledge like your digital certificate of everything the quantification of your knowledge and being able to take that from job to job and out into the community and it represents basically your ROI or your impact that you're having on an organization the open community or even groups that you're working with yeah. how powerful that is as a knowledge worker yeah Amazing. So what what should people know about Declara or a story from Declara days so far that would be interesting? Yeah, you know, so, um, yeah, there's so many interests, like my story, so many interesting stories. But, um, you know, it, being in a startup is a little bit like being on a roller coaster ride. You have your up days, your down days, and... Um, probably have post-traumatic stress from being a, a startup CEO because every day is a different experience. But, um, you know, we when we um, decided to extend out and have a consumer product, you could imagine, you know, your investors and your board look at you and they're like, but you're so successful doing the enterprise, why would you take this on? 
and and it's at those times where you have to really take a very deep look on your core values and take the risk like I could keep doing what we were doing but over the next five years the world's going to fundamentally change and if we didn't take the lead in building out the consumer product and bring ubiquitous learning to the world and really innovate into the space so Facebook owns the social graph LinkedIn the professional graph well we want to own the the knowledge graph mm -hmm. and knowledge workers are growing uh, faster and faster worldwide but they have nothing that represents quantitatively what they understand and that they own to be able to take with them and so we really wanted to provide that and to provide ubiquitous learning so that we can solve big real world problems and be that uh, your secret weapon in your hip pocket wherever you go. Yeah, Ramon and I've heard you say something like that about even in your accident days sometimes the ceo feels like the darkest days yeah. what what's been the toughest part about being ceo i think um the toughest part is that you have to put the company ahead of everything like uh, you know when you are making decisions around personnel and like, for instance, um, when you get a certain amount of money, you have to make that money last for a long time. You don't want to be frivolous with it because this is hard-earned money that, that people have invested in you. Right. So you have, you have to protect it and make it last. But there are these decisions that you make that to go fast, you're going to have certain numbers of people. And then as I automate things, it's like the brain. When you're learning a new language, your brain incorporates um, the language area, makes it, takes over different areas of the brain, and then it becomes efficient and condenses. So as a company uh, automates things, like we automate at QA, well, I don't need to have a bunch of quality assurance people anymore. And even though I love these people, I had to... Uh, go down in efficiencies and let yeah. those folks go because we have automated the tools. Yeah. So are people uh, scared they're going to eliminate themselves? Like they're going to create this algorithm that's going to eliminate their own job essentially. That's okay. what's happening across the United States, yeah. right? Yeah. So like when you think about what happened in the the car industry, basically you have robots that don't want benefits, don't need pay don't show up on every day to work. Uh, yeah. They work 24 seven and have a little bit of maintenance. And so what scares me, you know, like I'll hear schools say, Hey, let's start teaching kids to code. Well, that's great. Except for ultimately we'll automate that. So we need to start teaching people those higher order cognitive skills so that they can be able to command those codes and architect the software and do the things that automation will never be able to eliminate. Yeah. The more creative, imaginative, innovative aspects of a, a knowledge worker's job. Yeah. Any other tough, tough points that people, other CEOs or people running a company should think about from your experience? I think... <laughs> the the number one job of the CEO is fundraising all the time. And, um, you know, and I think that it's tough because the because what you're doing is you're trying to create a vision for investors about something in the future that is intangible to them. Right. And them to believe that that is the future and that you're going to solve that problem and that's yeah. an important problem. And you'll be able to monetize that. Right. That is super hard. And you'll hear a thousand no's before you even hear one yes. Mm -hmm. Because it's going to be that one person who can actually mentally image what that is going to be. Like, for instance, I'm sure when, um, so the Google guys, um, their, their name used to be, I forgot, Backbone or something like that. But it was a different name. And when they were trying to say, look, we can index everything. And, you know, it took them years to get to there. And how do you tell people, yeah, people are going to search. Yeah, right. 
They weren't and, even using the internet, yeah. Right. So it's there there is this um and what they solved first was the library pro- problem at Stanford. So searching across the library. So there's on an internet. So there's this um how do you help people see that? And I have mm-hmm. mentored lots of small startups and they're in our office all the time asking that same question, how do you communicate what my um, platform's doing or what my technology or my innovation is Yeah, get it funded? <coughs> and so many companies go out of business between inception and trying to do that first raise. Yeah, yeah. I could see how that's very tough and I could see how it's easier, maybe not, the second time around when you've proven yourself, when you have all these amazing team members. I don't know if it actually is easier, maybe just as hard. Um, what was it like when you first did it, when you didn't have a proven company that you started and sold and and had all, and actually learned, like you said, scaling and everything else? Yeah, you know, it was I made a lot of mistakes. One of the mistakes that I did was micromanagement. So I had an employee who came up to me and, and she basically said, why'd you hire anybody if you can do everything in the company yourself? Mm. And then That's I a went, jab. Yeah. Yeah, I went, oh, okay, I need to learn how to take my hands off the keyboard and let other people do their jobs. Mm-hmm. And then... So when I started Synaptic Mash, I really, you know, I have to catch myself so much because I can see what what I want the product to do. But you have to trust people, and then when they make mistakes, you have to realign them or you have to let them go. But um, you hire leaders for a reason, and you have to help guide them to be successful leaders. And I learned something else from one of my employees here and we we were hiring people and we would take so much time and we were always hiring with perfection and never firing or anything and um, what what this person said to me was you're not taking enough risks Mm. until until you fired people or done riffs you haven't taken enough risks on people and brought them in to get that knowledge that you would otherwise have found. That person who thinks different than you, or codes different, or um, builds the data yeah. sciences different. And you know, there's a lot of risk mm. in that. You know, you're bringing in people, and they're taking risks. Yeah. And so you'll try on things, and then something will stick. And we acquired a company, and it was the best thing we did. But Everybody in the company was like, don't acquire, you know, like the the uh, leadership, don't acquire that company. And the moment we brought that team in and it was mm-hmm. like we stepped on the accelerator wow. and it brought new inspiration, new ways to look at the same problems and uh, helped us become a much better company. Yeah. So sometimes you have to take those risks mm-hmm. and... You have to know in your heart you're right, and you have to know in your heart when no one else can see it how to find those key people in your company who can help you build your vision yeah. and build it better than you. Because the moment that I was able to bring in people I trusted, they started innovating on top of my innovation, making it better than me. Yeah. Ramona, this has been truly amazing. I want to thank you so much for your time. And where can we, we'll point people towards Declara. What should people do once they're on there? Um, get on Declara, search for me, and get on, uh, follow me, and get into my collections and start creating collections. Because what happens is, as you're collecting and inciting, you're actually, as you're learning, you're teaching others, and it's truly magical. So uh, we all learn when you learn, and I feel really honored to be on this. Thank you so yeah. much. Ramona, it's been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. I can't wait to watch the uh, movie that comes out about you at someday. Is there an actual someone coming out with a movie or, or writing a script yeah. for 
Yep, actually, um, you know, uh, Sting's wife is a producer, and she has a great team um, that they put together. Uh, one of, I guess, one of the directors from um, uh, the first Twilight are coming together to to do a movie, and we're negotiating certain things right now. But uh, yeah, looks yeah. like it's a go and. That's yeah. amazing. It's one of those things I think I'll, you know, people watch it and it'll say based on a true story and all of it will be true, but people won't they'll think, oh, half of that's not real. And the whole thing will be exactly what happened. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, well, with my crazy life, it'd have to be a series. <laughs> yes. But um, thank you so much, Ramona. And uh, everyone should check out Declara. Thank you so much. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. What I got. Feeling like a hundred grand